What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. Today we celebrate the dads among us and all those people who have poured into us, the father figures that have helped make us who we are today. Abraham from the book of Genesis is known as Father Abraham, and though he only had one child to fulfill God's promise to him, he would go on to be the father figure for thousands and thousands of years to come. Billions of people claim him as their father figure. So what better time to examine his life than on this Father's Day? Let's hear a scripture for today from Judy Ann. She is going to read for us from Genesis 18, where a son is promised to him and his wife, Sarah. This happens just after Abram has his name changed from Abram, demonstrating his status as God's chosen servant. God has covenanted with them. It's more than a bargain for divine protection or a deal to give people some good things. This is God desiring a deep, ongoing relationship with human beings. Let's hear more of the revelation of this promise. It's brought to Abraham by some visitors for dinner. This is Genesis 18, 1 through 15. Hear now the word of the Lord. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Marna as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, He ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. And then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. And they said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. And then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the next, at the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh, yes, you did laugh. And from Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 8, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, make us an inclusive community passionately following Jesus Christ. Let the example of Abraham speak into our lives today as we seek to be your covenant people living as you call us to live. 
Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I remember several years ago when I was asked to host the Christmas dinner party for all the churches in our area. It was the old Palisades District. The Reverend Wayne Plumstead, who many of you know, was the district superintendent then, and he was the one who told me I had to host. I agreed and asked a few questions, the most important of which was, what's the budget? How much money do we have to spend on this dinner? And he told me, there's no budget. You can spend whatever you need to do this. And I couldn't believe it. Wayne just gave me a blank check to host a dinner party for 80 to 100 people. So I gathered the church people together, and we talked about what we wanted to do, and came up with this harebrained scheme where we would do the service of lessons and carols from the book of worship. Uh, So we'd read some scripture, sing a Christmas song together, and then serve a course of a meal. Now, you wouldn't know this unless you had it right in front of you, but there are seven lessons and seven carols. That means we served a seven-course meal for the Christmas party. We had scallops and jumbo shrimp, chicken, and not just any beef. We had filet mignon. Uh, I'm still surprised we didn't serve caviar on that day, but we went all out. There was so much food, by the fifth course, course, everyone was done. We hadn't even wheeled out dessert yet, and people were worried about how they would get home with such full bellies. After the party, I sent the bill in and I got a call from Wayne. He said, Brian, I can't believe how much money you spent. Why'd you do that? And I said, Wayne, you said I could spend whatever I wanted on the dinner. I guess he had forgotten because he said, I did. I said, yeah, that's what you said. And I never heard from him about it again. But after that was when they switched to potlucks for the Christmas party. So I guess you can blame me for that. As I think back on that time, I can see how easy it is to host someone when you are spending someone else's money in someone else's building. An unlimited budget let me do whatever I wanted. What is much harder to do, though, is to be a good host when it's your money on the line, when you are responsible, when it's your home and your work to pay the bill. Now compare that to Kelly, who always hated all the work she had to do before a dinner party. She would spend the day cleaning the house, getting the kids to pick up their toys and take care of the mess they made in the bathroom. Picking the right food was always a problem too. Do you you make the meal that was tried and true, that you knew you could make well, even though it's not really what you want to do? Or do you pick something fun and unique that might wind up a total disaster? With all the anxieties surrounding dinner parties, she found herself just not inviting people over. It was too much work, too much stress, and in the end, not the kind of fun she wanted to have with her friends. That is, until her friend had moved away and then returned a few years later, this friend had moved to Canada where everyone just showed up and would stay for dinner. Folks were laid back about it. They didn't clean up. They didn't scurry around to make everything perfect. They just had friends over and offered for them to stay for dinner to eat whatever was being served that evening. Nice, simple, easy. When Kelly heard about this radical form of hospitality from her friend, they gave it a name. They called it the terrible dinner party. And because there were no rules to follow, it meant they could get together more often and and have dinners. That's not a bad trade-off, is it? So what should it look like then if we were going to host someone? What does real hospitality look like? Is it extravagant, over the top, spending a lot of money? Or is it really about the people and getting together just as you are? It's a good thing we have Father Abraham to show us what hosting ought to look like. In Genesis 18, Abraham is right at the entrance of his tent. It's hot outside, so people would take a break midday where they could both be in the shade of the tent and get a little bit of a breeze coming through. Typically, people in that time and place would take a siesta, an afternoon nap, because it was too hot to work during that time. That reminds me very much of uh, my, my father. We would watch football with my dad when I was a kid. He'd be standing up and shouting at the TV, cheering his team on. Then halftime would come, and it was like the game was over. We'd eat too much food, and then he'd be snoring through the last half of the game. Sunday was always this, church football, and then the afternoon nap halfway through the game, right? 
With Abraham, we get a, a, a sense here that he was maybe nodding off like my dad because suddenly there are three men near him. He doesn't know them. He can't tell if they are friend or foe, but they have just appeared before him. It's almost as if he's startled by this. Now look what happens. The first thing he does is run up to them and bow down to them. He is showing deep respect for these visitors. He practically begs them to stay and eat dinner with him. Then he gets water to, to drink, washes their feet, gives them shade to rest. He is doing everything he can to treat them right, essentially saying, it is my pleasure you have come here. You have made my day. This is totally over the top. Next, he offers a bit of food and then over delivers. He runs to make bread. Our translation says three measures of bread, which makes it sound like maybe three loaves or something. That'd be great, but what he actually makes is 20 quarts of flour. That's 22 pounds of bread. It's enough to feed an army. Then he runs to make the standard side dishes, then runs again to have a, a bowl killed and cooked. This is the best thing he has to offer for food, and he gives it away freely. This is royal treatment to three complete strangers. After everything is ready, all is prepared, he serves it to these guests and patiently waits in the background like a good host to let them enjoy the lavish banquet he has prepared. I'm sure it was way too much food for them to eat, so thinking back to my Christmas party, at least I have that in common with Father Abraham. And then we see the result of this overly generous hospitality. We've known from the start that the Lord visited Abraham. This whole time, these three visitors seemed like just men to Abraham. And then the big reveal comes. It's subtle at first. One of the men says, where is your wife, Sarah? He knows Abraham's wife's name. That's interesting. And then he says, Sarah will have a baby. She's, she's very old at this point. She says she is literally worn out. She can't have a baby. So she laughs to herself. And though this visitor can't see her, he knows she laughed. Then he declares it again, you will have a child by this time next year. Abraham's generous hospitality has led to the promise of a child. That's a big deal in ancient times. To not have a child meant you had no one to pass your land onto or your possessions to. There was even plenty of public shame associated with it. So this declaration would have been incredibly good news for Abraham and Sarah. The next couple of chapters talk about a, a pretty famous story, Sodom and Gomorrah, and how these cities were destroyed by God. People posit all kinds of reasons why God chose to destroy these cities, but the real reason, the biblical reason for it, is right here. Abraham was hospitable, so he was blessed. The people of those cities were evil and did not offer hospitality, but harm to visitors, so they were destroyed. It's almost as if God is holding up a mirror to these two groups, one to Abraham saying, Look what happens when you offer your very best to strangers. You entertain angels and, and the Lord himself when you welcome in visitors. The other mirror, though, is held up to those who are like Sodom, bringing violence against others. You will be ruined with a life like that. No good comes from treating strangers poorly. One of the qualities I always admire in men, especially in fathers, is when they can make someone feel at ease, welcomed in their home or out at an event. Fathers can have such a profound impact on how people feel about whether they belong or not, whether they are welcomed in. I think of Joe as, as one of those guys. He's here today with us. The way he walks into a room with his flip-flops and can crack a joke about the ineptitude of state government is on point. We had a brief service for Tom Kemper this week to do his interment, and Joe just has a way of putting people at ease, even at a memorial like that. It's hospitality for all, just like Abraham would have done. There are lots of different ways to show hospitality to people. Some say to invite someone over for a meal, whether your house is clean or not. Just make the connection. You can give someone flowers or a gift, send a text encouraging someone, or a note in the mail that says you care. It doesn't take much to signal to someone that you are 
hospitable, that you are friendly toward not just your friends, but even strangers. When you care about people like Abraham did, even strangers get the royal treatment. Last week, I happened to cross a lesson that was a good reminder of what real hospitality looks like. Often we think of caring for others means we try and cheer them up. We try and make them laugh or feel included. But that's not always what's most helpful, especially when someone is grieving. Over the years, I've seen people try and force this on people who are hurting, and it is so painful to watch. They want to make someone feel better by cheering them up or telling them to be happy or trying to help them move on, and it just doesn't work to really help someone who is in deep struggle. The best thing we can do is to be a witness, to acknowledge the pain, to let it hurt. Don't give advice. Don't try and help. Just listen. Let a person struggling share their story and accept it just as it is. I had a chance to do that with Naomi this past week. I talked with her last week on the phone after her son had died, and then this week we sat down together. She shared such profound loss with me, not just with her son dying, but five years ago she lost her daughter. Before that, it was her husband. And she also told me about many, many years ago when she lost her son who was just a teenager at the time. How awful, how terrible to lose a child not once, not twice, but three times. That wasn't even all of it. When Naomi was a teenager, her own father had died. So many close family members lost in an untimely way. How do you possibly offer hospitality to someone in a situation like that. And the only viable answer is you listen. You bear witness to these terrible things so they know they are not alone. And I want her to know today, we are here with you, Naomi. Hospitality is not just about a dinner party. It's making space for people no matter what they might be going through. It is blessing people no matter where they are in the journey of life. For Abraham, he welcomed some strangers that turned out to be angels, and the Lord declared that the impossible would suddenly be possible. He would have a son even in old age. With Jesus, he sent out his disciples and told them to proclaim the good news. You received without payment, now give without payment. When people welcome them into their homes, they receive the disciples of Jesus Christ himself. Who knows who you might welcome with dinner, with some kind words, with a listening ear. Maybe it will be a brother or sister in Christ. Maybe it will be a new best friend. Or maybe it will be the Lord himself taking on an unexpected disguise. Fathers are at their best when they make us feel welcome included, and part of the family no matter the circumstance. May you be like them today, welcoming all with the love of Jesus Christ, no matter how old you are. Amen? Amen. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.